culture on the battlefield called science, then we are going to have to understand a few things about science from the Bible perspective. And I just think this is a fascinating subject. I, I remember Dr. Groom got saved later in life. Um, and it was because he had a trouble accepting this whole idea of creation. Until he could settle in his mind creation, evolution, he couldn't uh, settle in his mind his need of a savior. And so I think this is an important battlefield. It's one we have to uh, become equipped and skillful to be salt and to be light. We'll start in Psalm 19 this morning. And we'll end up in the New Testament here in just a, a minute here. And in Psalm 19, we see the purpose of science. The purpose of science. And I think it's, it's important for us to understand that science has a purpose. When we see it from a biblical perspective, it helps. Look at Psalm 19, beginning in verse 1. Notice what uh, David writes. He writes, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Uh, I'm just glad I get to teach chemistry. I just find it absolutely fascinating, this world on a micro level, how everything is in balance, and how 117 or so different elements make up all matter in the universe, and the rules that govern it. Uh, I find the, mi the micro uh, level very, very exciting. Oh, but I tell you what, those few opportunities I've had a chance to go to the middle of Nevada, to where my mother and her family lived when she was a child. If you know where Tonopah is, you know where Eli is, they're about 130 miles apart. My mom was born right about in the middle. All right, mining camp, <laughs> five children in school, uh, all of them cousins. Her aunt taught the, the school. Uh, there are no lights out there, all right? We go out there in the middle of the summer. There's no, there's very little water vapor in the atmosphere. The sky is unbelievable. Some of you had that opportunity on the mainland, all right? Now you come here to Hawaii and you see about six stars, and I'm not sure that might be a plane coming into Honolulu. Oh yeah, it's moving, all right? Uh, but the firmament, the stars, God's creation, unbelievable. It ought to draw our attention to the fact that there is a creator and that we are the creature. Look how David expands this idea. He says in verse 2, Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he hath set a tabernacle for the sun, which as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run a race, his going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. We look at creation, and day after day, night after night, the different phenomenon that we see, they speak about the glory, the majesty, the power of God. Uh, in our notes, we see God's magnificent design in creation. And when we try to understand the purpose of science, number one, creation speaks to the fact that there's got to be a creator, a God. The problem is it doesn't speak very clearly, all right? Because no one's going to get saved by looking at the stars watching the sun in its course, breaking out the microscope and the lab equipment and examining the world on a micro level. But man is going to be humbled. Man's going to realize there's something bigger. There's something or someone who has put all of this together. So David carries that step further. Look at verse 7. He shifts gears. I, you would think this guy was um, schizophrenic because he's writing this beautiful poem about nature and all of a sudden he stops in mid-tracks and now he's going to talk all about the Word of God. Verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. 
The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. He shifts gears here, and he goes from creation to the word of God. Just as creation reveals that there is a God, the Bible reveals that there is a God, but the Bible does it much more clearly. The Bible gives us from Genesis 1-1 to the end of the Revelation everything that God wants us to know about him. And we can go back to it again and again and again, black and white, see it for ourselves. So the word of God reveals that there is a, a creator and a God. Now don't, don't misunderstand me here. But you can read the Bible all day and still not be saved. You can be amazed by creation and nature. It's not going to save you. It should drive you, though, to the Bible so you can find out more about God. But it's got to go deeper than just the pages of the Bible. So look how he ends the psalm here. Begin in verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins, and let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, my redeemer. Creation drives David to the word of God. The word of God drives David to look at his heart. Because just as God is revealed in creation and God is revealed in the word. God wants to be revealed to us in the soul, in the inner man, in the heart of us. And, and notice how it progresses here. He says in verse 12, who, who can understand his heirs? Cleanse thou me from secret falls. We see that there is a God. We learn about him in the Bible, that he's holy, righteous, and just. And then we realize that we're not. We need a savior. I've got a sin problem. Then look what he says. Verse 13, keep back thy servants also from presumptuous sins. Let not them have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. He's, he's talking about cleansing here and the result of a cleansed heart. And then he says there in verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let my life be lived in a way that's pleasing to you. So when we step outside and we, we look at creation, man, there's a God. What an unbelievable God. We go to scriptures, we find out more about him and more about ourselves. We find out how to live a life that will please him. The purpose of science is to glorify God. I like telling the story of Annie's, Annie Ellsworth. Do you know Annie? Annie uh, grew up in Washington, D.C. Uh, she was 17 years old. She worked for the patent department. She got paid 10 cents a page to copy by hand <laughs> people's patent requests, to draw the picture, whatever it was, 10 cents a page. That's a lot of work for 10 cents, right? But her dad knew a famous inventor, Samuel Morse, inventor of the Morse code, all right, the telegraph, who was probably a better painter than he was an inventor. You got a painting by Samuel Morse in, in, in you know, grandma's house, don't sell that thing, it's going to be worth a lot of money. And he was, because he was uh, the friend of uh, Samuel, her dad was the friend of Samuel Morris, was given a unique opportunity. What should be the first message sent by the telegraph? She and her mom began reading through their Bible. They got to the book of Numbers, and there's this phrase in there. Remember the phrase? What hath God wrought? Oh, look what God has done. But don't you mean Samuel Morris? He, he figured out the electricity thing, the telegraph, the, 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 the dot dot stuff. 
Yeah, Samuel Mar Morris, he gets credit for the telegraph. Hey, but God gets credit for this world that allows the telegraph to be made possible. Oh, and it's not just to glorify God, because what happened next? Ooh, it benefited man. Why science? Why the acquisition of knowledge? Why the pursuit to get more information? It ought to be twofold. Number one, to glorify God. And number two, to benefit man. But because we're sinful creatures, we leave God out of the cre creation and we take the credit ourselves. And do we always use science to benefit man? Oh, no. We don't always. <laughs> no. Yeah, we, we come up with new drugs. All right, we come up with new procedures. We come up with new, uh, better, more efficient ways of doing things. <sighs> but so we can make money, all right? Or we use it as a weapon, all right? Or we end up hurting people with it. Amniocentesis. Sorry to bring up a painful experience for any of you, all right? where they insert the uh, long needle into the womb and draw off just a little bit of the amniotic fluid. Wow, they can do that? And they can find out about the baby? But for what purpose? Abortion. You ought to not have this child because there's a physical problem with this child. <sighs> right off the street here, down a couple of blocks, we had a young family in our school. Mom uh, was told that her little baby boy she was expecting had uh, encephalitis, water on the brain. You need to abort him. There's no reason to bring this child in. All the pressure, all the excuses in the world, but that family committed, loves the Lord. They carried the baby to full term, and yes, it did have some physical problems, but the young man is doing fine today. He's probably about 20, 22 years old now, all right? Yeah, sometimes I think what we do as men and mankind is we want to acquire all this knowledge so that we can play God instead of God uh, allowed to be God. Uh, let me show you something about creation too, by the way. I found this fascinating. I found it in this book here. Hey, you want to know more? Uh, I got a couple of books for you. Redeeming Science. Okay, I'll talk about this one in just a minute. This is my favorite one. Dar I just love that picture of this guy here and this monkey here. Darwin's black box. Now this one's written by a Christian. This one's written by a Catholic fellow who doesn't ever preach creation. Preaches intelligence design and things. So it's, it's not really a theological book. But what uh, this fellow has written, his thesis was if Charles Darwin had been a microbiologist. Charles Darwin never would have been an evolutionist. Because when you look at the cellular level and how a cell functions and all the parts of a cell, it's absolutely amazing. I like chemistry. I like physics. I like earth science. I like astronomy. I'm not a big fan of biology. Anybody just thought biology was the greatest thing in the world when you got a chance to cut something up? couple of you. I was a chemistry lab assistant for, in high school for my teacher. And in the back room, I had the keys, was a bathtub. And in the bathtub were all these fetal pigs with the, what they used back then, formaldehyde. No safety warnings back then. Ah, it smelled so bad. But I have to go back there, pull stuff, prepare stuff. Oh, I'm not taking biology ever. So I've had this attitude towards biology. And then uh, Isaiah Peterson, who taught biology for, gave me this book, and I read it on the plane. And it, it, oh, amazing. Just real quickly, um, a human cell, the way it functions and depends on the different parts of the cell, is analogous to a mouse trap. A mouse trap needs five parts: uh, the base, the, the hammer part that slams, the spring, the trigger. Five different parts. You have to have all five parts for the mouse trap to work. You, you can't just expect to catch a mouse with a little piece of wood, okay? The human cell can't function 
unless all of the parts are present in that cell. And it's amazing, these little organic machines inside these cells. Uh, and it's not five little parts. It's incredible, the moving parts inside some of these cells. And there's no way that it could have developed over billions and billions of years if it uh, required you know, all of those parts at once to function. You want to borrow this one? It's, it's a good one. Just make sure you give it back, because I, I like the picture. And then there's all sorts of uh, DVDs here and in our library from the Creation Museum. And uh, that's the one right outside of Cincinnati. And uh, I got a good deal on these because Bryce, my son-in-law's dad's the executive director there at the museum. Okay, so those you can keep. I got you know for years before you return them. But in this book, I, I just I just got to do two. We're going to do science again next week. Okay, because I got to slow down. Got to slow down. Redeeming science. You have friends who are uh, Bible, true knowledge, science over here, okay? Uh, or they claim to be a scientist. By the way, what would a, if the root word for science is the Latin word sire, to, to know, or scient, to know, what is a scientist then? It's just someone who knows. And probably a little more than you and I know, but he know, that's all he does. He knows. In the 1800s, the phrase was coined, scientist, all right? If we could also say a, a knowledgeist, you know, someone who knows, all right? Well, if you have a scientist, someone who just loves science, they, they will talk to you all day about uh, the scientific method. Because the war, the universe as created by God follows a basic cause and effect pattern, you can set up these science experiments and repeat it over and over and over again because they're trying to go from a premise to a hypothesis to a thesis to declare something a what? A law. That it's always going to work. Listen to this short list of, of a law. Scientific laws are, number one, applicable at all places. Gravity works here, gravity works on the other side of the planet. All right? They're applicable at all times. Scientific laws don't, don't operate just during peak hours. Okay? Do not change with time. Gravity's always been gravity. All right? Known only by their effect. I know what gravity does, but but what is it? Well, I think it has something to do with the mass of the two objects, all right? We know that. All right? We get more complicated about it, but it's by observable data. Number five, they're absolute scientific laws. Once we've established them, once we've proven them, we've gone over and over and over again the scientific method, okay, that's a law, all right? They're absolute. They're infallible. They don't, they don't fail. It, it's always, you can count on gravity's, we're not floating off unless the rapture takes place, right? Uh, they exercise power over man, and they touch all aspects of creation. And if you want a detailed explanation of them, this guy goes through those things. And your unsaved scientific friend who believes in scientific laws, who study everything out according to scientific laws, on the other hand, we'll say everything happened by random, by chance. Evolution. Evolution is just chance. Are you telling me it just happened by chance and it always follows absolute infallible laws all the time? I don't think so. All right. Purpose of science. Whether we're studying it in outer space or studying it in the laboratory, it's so that we say, wow. What a great God. And then as we acquire this knowledge, look what we can do for men, all right, for others. And anytime we get that order wrong or leave something out, then we're not following the purpose of science. Let me show you the second passage I wanted us to look at. We'll spend a little bit more time here. Go over to 2 Peter chapter 3.
2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I, have, which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved on the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Uh, verse 1, pure minds, remembrance. Verse 2, mindful. Verse 3, knowing. Verse 5 and verse 8, don't be ignorant. He's talking about knowing. This leads to the study of, they call it epistemology. How do we know? How do we learn anything? I always think of my friend Larry. Larry and I worked in a welding shop in northwest Georgia while I was going through Bible college. And he wasn't in college or anything. He was just a kid from Chattanooga. And uh, he was content to work in this welding shop and clean these beautiful ornamental security storm doors that weighed 120 to 160 pounds. He'd just wash them, clean up the slag, but we called them dingleberries, the little round pieces of metal that would pool up on the... He was just content. He had dreadlocks before anybody had dreadlocks, okay? This is 1981. Um, Larry, Larry used to wear a blue and white striped Chevron gas station shirt and cut off jeans. And Ringgold, Georgia was about 12 miles from Chattanooga. Sometimes he would run to work. Sometimes he'd run home from work. The guy was in, in... I saw him once lay down on the grimy floor, pump out 300 sit-ups, just like a rubber band. All right? Larry had a retractable key chain. And he thought, I wonder if bad guys caught me and tied me up, would I be able to run home? So here's this young kid, dreadlocks, blue and white striped shirt, hands tied behind his back, running down I-75, trying to get home. And Catoosa County Sheriff's cars are white, unmarked Trans Ams. And they come slamming in and sliding in guns out. They thought they had an escape chain gang member. And he can't get his hands out because they're got them tied up behind his back. So that's the sort of person Larry was, OK? He did a lot of drugs. The guys at work call them space, you know, I call them Larry. But one day in the break room, probably 30, 40 degrees that day, the foreman is drinking his soup out of his thermos and Larry said to him, Joe, your thermos keeps hot things hot, don't it? Yeah, Larry, that's right. A few minutes later, Joe, thermos will keep cold things cold, won't it? I'll never forget, Larry said, how do it know? How do it know to keep the hot things hot? And how does it know to keep the cold things cold? And we know insulation now. But Larry was serious, all right? You know, is there a switch on it? To keep? But the question is so good. How do we know anything? Historically and philosophically, this is how we have known. Number one, because God has revealed it to us through his word, the Bible. Look at verse 1, chapter 3. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord Savior. Yeah, but he's talking about Bible stuff, like theology stuff. You mean like family? You mean like government? You mean like history? Like economics? All right? Uh, ethics? Aesthetics? 
The Bible has so much things, but we've been told this wedge has been driven be, that the Bible isn't a science book. It is a science book because the word science means to know, all right? And the starting place for knowing anything is to see it from God's perspective. But look at verse 2, or verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Beginning with Thomas Aquinas, in the age of enlightenment and the philosophy of rationalism, reason became more important than the Bible. Thomas Aquinas, good Catholic boy, said that when man fell, it affected his will, his emotion, his soul, but not his mind. My, man can still think right. I got news for you. We don't think right. We don't make right choices. Even when we got the best of intention, we sometimes make mistakes. All right? Our, our mind will play tricks on us. Have you seen that cable show, I don't know, 72, 73, 74, where they play these mind games? Oh, it's really interesting. All right? What our eyes, the tricks that it will play on us and things. But now, beginning with Thomas Aquinas, reason surpassed the queen of theology, Bible. Look what he says now in verse, oh, there's something else interesting there. You can see his logic. They're scoffers. All right? They're making fun. All right? And, uh, hey, where's the promise of his coming? According to our logic, everything is continued as it has from the beginning. This is called uniformitarianism. I like it because it's a big word and I can say it. Uniformitarianism. All right? It's the idea that everything has continued the same from the very beginning of time, uniformly. It was over here on the north shore of Kauai, mayor, the mayor, I uh, can't remember her name, Yuki Mura or something. We had this hurricane hit Hawaii and a big chunk of the Nepali coastline came down. And in the news report, it, it just stuck, uh, Joanne Yukimura, that was her name. She said, oh, imagine that. Thousands of years of evolution in one storm. Well, it's not evolution, but I, I knew what she meant, all right? But it was one storm, and it changed the topography of that island in a big way. Because evolutionists, for there to be enough random chances, have to say that everything has been the same for billions and billions and billions of years. Oh, instead of uniformitarianism, it should be catastrophism. Catastrophism. One really big superstorm called the flood. Look at verse uh, 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world was then, was, being overflowed with water, perished, and changed drastically the topography, the geography of the world, and I think even the climate patterns and other things. All right? I think there's one of these DVDs that talk about the flood up here if you want to borrow it. Oh, their logic was flawed. All right? Uh, yeah, it's just so little time and so much. <laughs> I will have to stop here. All right, I'll give you the third one though. All right, Bible reason, and then empiricism. And empiricism, part of rationalism. Although rationalism is strictly the reasoning side, but empiricism is that lab coat science mentality, the science fair, you know, doing the experiments, the, the, the laws, and everything following it. And the only way you can really know something is if you investigate it scientifically. But I want to show you a couple of things about investigating things scientifically next week that I think you'll find interesting, okay? It's called operational science and origin science. Both are valid, both are used by scientists, but they kind of don't make a big deal out of the origin science. You've got to come back next week and find out what that's about, okay? All right. And then we'll hammer this thing home because it's about salt and light. This world's trying to drive this wedge and done a pretty good job of separating 
Bible and science from each other. Uh, but how do we act as salt and be able to communicate these ideas so that people will listen? Ah, hey, here's one. This is a really cool book. You ought to read that. Nothing else, the picture. All right. Oops. Hey, you, you got an unsaved friend? It's the first step here. All right. He's not going to preach creation and preach intelligent design. When you realize there is a designer, then, okay, well, who is he then? All right. Hey, our logic, reason, reason's good. This guy is logical. Whew. Hard to refute. Uh, we live in the 30 minute window called TV sitcom programming. That's about the attention span of most adults. And even then, we have to click past the commercials, right? Type of thing. So, hey, I saw this video. You got to see this video. Hey, why don't you come over to the house? We'll watch the video. You bring the popcorn, I'll bring the video. Okay? You don't have to tell them what the video is. All right? But to, to, to do it in a way that leaves a good taste in their mouth, a thirst for more salt. But at the same time, light, to be able to turn on the truth. And I think it's so important for today's culture if we're going to be effective in impacting it. Let's pray. Lord, I do want to thank you for the opportunity we've had together this morning. I look to your word. Uh, Lord, to be challenged, to be stretched, I hope. Lord, I pray that you would equip us in this area. Give us opportunity to learn more. And we could be effective in sharing the gospel and, and with our friends, co-workers. Lord, I do want to thank you for our church service coming up. We pray that you uh, bless and that we have a, a great uh, time of magnifying and lifting up your name. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask Jose to come. He's got a couple of announcements for us. And if you want to borrow these books, just come on up. Just remember where you got them from. And when you're done, give them back. All right.